to you from Columbus, Ohio. Welcome to another episode of Just Calvin. Hello and welcome to another edition of Just Calvin. I am here with Kate Tomasello, who is running against uh, Chuck De Chuck Schumer, I'll just say that, uh, for a seat in uh, New York. Uh, how are you today? I'm doing well. And yourself? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, first of all, you're, all rep you're representing the Green Party in New York. Uh, what is your platform? Well, my platform, um, policy number one, is, if you look on my website, policy number one is to pass the Green New Deal. Now, the Green New Deal that our party has put forward is different than the one that the Democrats in the House and Senate are proposing because it phases out nuclear energy and it also um, bans fracking. Now, one of the reasons why I think it's incredibly important for us to do both of those things at the same time is because our neighboring state of Pennsylvania, which is just south of us, has um, three nuclear power plants. Um, one is in um, Washington County, and there's another one uh, right next to, um, oh, I, I forget which counties they're called, but they're right next to they're very close to new york city and new jersey and the two the three counties that are next to new jersey and new york city um they have fracking wells that are very that very commonly have a lot of violations in terms of reporting to the epa the every single fracking well in the country has to report infractions and um, and basically mistakes that they make to the EPA in order to maintain their um, their federal funding. So anytime these fracking well wells are cited or fined for an infraction that can um, cause harm to to people or to the environment. They have to. Rep they are reported and they are fined because of it. Now the the three now the three counties that have the most um, fracking wells with the most number of infractions, they happen to be right next to a nuclear power plant. And the reason why that is so incredibly dangerous is because fracking is a process by which you drill into the um, into the ground and you fracture the underlying the underlying stone that the soil and the trees and the buildings and everything we see above the ground rests on top of. And by drilling into, into the stone, they release fracking fluid into, um, into the stone and cause the Man, I can't, I knew all of this stuff before we began and I just forgot, but, um, but essentially what happens, but essentially what happens is when people, when you start a fracking well, you drill into the stone under, under the ground and you release fracking fluid into that stone, which destabilizes it, but it also causes natural gas to bubble through. So that way they can collect it at the top of the um, at the site on top of the ground. Now, this destabilizes the ground that our houses are built on top of, our buildings are built on top of, and, and it causes earthquakes. That's why in Oklahoma, which has, um, so it, it's one of the states that has one of the largest um, collections of fracking wells in the country. That's why you see all of these earthquakes earthquakes happening because in order for fracking wells to collect natural gas, they have to um, destabilize the stone that our buildings are built on top of. And that, that, that just compromises the foundation that is built below the foundations that our houses are built on top of. And 
the reason I build, bring up earthquakes is because back in 2016 or 17, um, we, we saw a situation arise in Japan where the, the nuclear power plants in Fukushima, they were hit by an earthquake and now they, they can, it's not safe for people to operate that nuclear power plant because it's releasing all of this radioactive waste into these cooling tanks and their plan in 2023 is to start releasing that nuclear water into, into the ocean, which a lot of people are very upset about, um, fish, fishermen especially. Now, because um, these, the nuclear power plant that is right next to these three counties in Pennsylvania are so close, are, are so close by, and are so close by to the, the ground that they are purposefully destabilizing so that they can collect natural gas. I'm just wondering how much longer it's going to be before they have a Fukushima type, type of event happening where the ground becomes so unstable that it causes an earthquake right next to this nuclear power plant and causes it to leak nuclear waste, not only into the state of Pennsylvania, but into New York state, and especially right next to New York City where millions of people are living. It's, it, they're basically bar living on borrowed time and gambling how much how longer they can extract um, natural gas from these um, fracking sites. And it's, I, I, I'm worried, I'm very worried about what's going to happen if we don't ban, ban fracking in the United States. We could easily see um, an issue arise where we have um, a, a nuclear power plant that is leaking toxic radiation into the surrounding areas, including where millions of people live. You know, if there, there were millions of people who live around the site at Fukushima, and I just imagine what would happen to all of those millions of people living in New York City if something from you know, down from upwind managed to break and release all of that nuclear waste into a city that happens to be one of the biggest cities in the world. You know, millions of people could be poisoned by, by a natural, not a natural disaster, but, but a man-made disaster like this. And that's why it's incredibly important for us to ban fracking and ban nuclear energy all at the same time because we do not need a Fukushima next to New York City. We really do not. And uh, what has Schumer not done uh, to prevent this from happening? Well, I mean, it goes back decades. People have been begging um, Chuck Schumer to ban or to phase out the nuclear power plants that we have one is right in between Buffalo and Rochester. It's just north of here, right next to Niagara Falls. Um, or, well, I shouldn't say right next to it. It's about 25 minutes away from, nuclear, from Niagara Falls. And um, there's another one that is near the Catskills. And people have been telling him to phase it out. Pe people in our home state do not want these. N ever since Chernobyl happened, people have been telling... Um, our elected representatives, get rid of these nuclear power plants. We don't want this in our backyard, get rid of it. And, you know, Chuck Schumer has been in the Senate for years, decades even. And he, has, he hasn't done what he knows his constituents wanted even before he was elected. He has not done this. And so we, so I don't think he's inclined, so because he's not inclined to ban um, nuclear power plants in New York State, there's really no reason to think that he's inclined to ban them on a national scale. And that's what the Green New Deal is, is supposed to do. And there, there's, um, aside from banning fracking and phasing out nuclear energy, there's a few other things that I want to add personally to the Green New Deal that really nobody is talking about. Um, now, last year, during the pandemic, we saw that people were not traveling. People lost their jobs. People got laid off from jobs that they had had um, for decades. And even on Yelp.com, which is one of the largest um, 
uh, business reporting websites in the world, they reported that 60% of their of of the businesses that were registered on their website closed their doors permanently and were not going to reopen. So people got laid off by the millions. Nobody was driving to work. Nobody was driving to school and present company included. I'm a school bus driver and every single school in the country shut down. So buses were not going anywhere. Airplanes were not going anywhere unless it was for medical emergencies, for doctors to travel abroad or for people to travel in order to get treatment or, or or, or medicine. So everything shut down. But despite the fact that nobody was driving, nobody was flying, nobody was going anywhere, we still saw an increase in the number of, in the amount of carbon emissions during 2020 that we saw in 2019 when people were going outside, when people were flying, when people were going places and on vacation, and they had the money to do it because they weren't getting laid off. So what happened? It, so why was that? Why was that the case? Why did we see the same amount of carbon emissions in 2020 as we saw in 2019 when people were traveling? And the answer is because is that the cause of global emissions is not to bl be blamed on people, especially in the public sector. You know, that we're, we're not the people who are releasing the most amount of carbon emissions. The number one um, industry that is, is the military industrial complex. We have people who are stationed in military bases in thousands of countries all over the world. We have wars that we are still waging in at least 10 different countries, several of which are in the Middle East, several more that are in Africa that you know doesn't get talked about on the news, but it's still happening. And the reason we are still seeing an increase in carbon emissions every single year, despite the travel ban that we saw last year, is because they are waging not just war on the people in these sovereign countries, but they are they are waging war on 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 the environment. They are, you know, they are propagating environmental destruction. They are blowing buildings to bits with drones. They are releasing um, depleted plutonium or depleted uranium in in Afghanistan. They are. Um, firing ballistics and bullets and causing whole villages and towns to be turned into something that resembles the Stone Age. The, the, this, all of this destruction has environmental consequences and it cannot be understated enough that if we want to stop these carbon emissions from, from getting worse, we need to end these wars and we need to nationalize the defense industry. People should not be making trillions of dollars every single year by manufacturing bombs and bullets that kill innocent people. And by innocent people, I mean civilians that are being killed by the hundreds of thousands every single, every single year in countries all over the world. You know, we, we need to nationalize the defense industry because if we don't, we are enabling people who have a monetary interest in continuing to manufacture weapons and bullets and, and other forms of ammunition as well as, um, as, well as weapons that, that deliver these weapons to, um, to these foreign countries overseas, like drones. You know, if we don't end the, if we do not stop the monetary incentive that these privately owned companies have to manufacture these weapons, then they are going to continue to propagate and advocate for endless wars all over the world. Okay. And, the, and the second thing that I want to propose um, that we add to the Green Party's Green New Deal is an end to the um, industrial fishing um, industries. I'm talking about companies that, um, I'm not talking about locally owned fisheries um, that have been passed down from generation to generation, from son to, from father to son and father to daughter. And 
you know, basically just are a way for people to make a living that yeah, yeah, yeah. you're talking about the, uh, the corporate fish right and like uh people, like corporations that make money on fishing and other uh other types of that yeah because since um, we have subsidies in this country that go towards paying um these industrial fishing companies millions of dollars every single year and um the reason we do that is to keep the price of um, fish and seafood that we buy in this country artificially low. But because we subsidize the industrial fishing industry, they have a lot of resources that have enabled them to fish commercially on basically what is what can be compared to poaching on an industrial scale. Mm -hmm. And since 19... 85, we have managed to extract 70% of the life in our oceans out of it. Mm -hmm. And the re and I, one of the reasons why we need to stop doing this is because the life of our oceans is dependent on um, the ability of fish to survive in it. And that's why we have to end the subsidies that we currently have that fund these industrial fishing companies. And we also need to um, establish no fishing zones, you know, places where um, local fishermen go out like maybe 500 yards away from the coast or a couple of miles away. And that's, you know, that's how they make their living. They go out for a day, they bring back their catch, and that's what sustains their, them, their families, and the village that they live in. You know, we need, especially in Somalia, that's why we see all of these people who are desperate for money because they are not able to make a living off of fishing in the ocean that they grew up next to. They, you know, they're, they're resorting to piracy and stealing money and resources from boats so that they can survive because they can't do it otherwise. And the reason they can't do it is because these industrial fishing companies have massive, large fishing boats that they, that are extremely well-funded that they use to extract millions and millions of pounds of fish and seafood from the oceans that these people depend on in order to survive. And if we don't wanna live on a planet with a dead ocean, then we need to stop consuming and, and fishing these, all of these species of fish to the brink of extinction. So many of the species that live in the, in the ocean are considered critically endangered because of the policies that have been enabled by our government. Oh, yeah, that well, them doing that enable them to do genetically modified uh, versions of those same uh, agriculture, like chicken and other things they've done. Uh, if you've noticed in the, in the last, say, 10 years, uh, chickens have been, have been a little overly plumped in regards to like they add extra to it because. They, they don't feed them. They don't treat them as well as they, as they should, as far as that, as far as that part goes. Uh, but, well, they uh, them on, well, they raise them on steroids in order to make them grow twice as fast, and that's why a lot of the chickens that are raised on these industrial farms are being are are dying from heart failure because their heart literally cannot keep up with the growth rate that these farmers expect them to grow at. Mm -hmm. uh, you're you're also for a uh, Medicare for all. Right? I am absolutely. Uh, uh, now, 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 is that for the same version as Howie Hawkins was going for, like the community-controlled uh, Medicare for all type system? Um, essentially, yes. But I'm going to try once I get to Congress to pass it at the federal level. Um, right now, in New York State, we have this bill that's existed for the last 19 years in the state Senate, which is called New York Health. And it would basically expand New York Medicaid to cover every single person in the state. And it would also cover um, dental, vision. It would cover mental health and 
addiction services. It would also cover in and out of state treatments and procedures. So say you have to go to um, a place like Cleveland Clinic in order to get treatment for an autoimmune disease that you have. And the doctors at the Cleveland Clinic are experts in this um, incredibly rare autoimmune disease. And they, they, that's just where you need to go in order to get effective treatment so you can live a more normal life. And so if you need to go there, a lot of people really can't because they just can't afford out-of-state procedures unless they're incredibly wealthy. But if we pass New York Health, then it, it would just be covered because you're a New York State resident and the bill would be footed by the state government. So, so, so you're saying, it sounds like you went, you're saying that use the same legislation that is built for New York, but use that at a federal level. Are you referring to like uh, the uh, United States federal government, not the state federal government? Yeah, I mean, I, I see the benefit of passing New York Health at a state level. Because if we set that precedent as the, one of the most populated states in the country, then we would be able to set off kind of like a tidal wave where you know, people would be moving into our state just so they could get free health care. You know, and with, with the influx of people moving into the state, pretty soon, um, pretty soon we would see other neighboring states such as Ohio, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Vermont, passing similar measures. And if we managed to get every single state in New England to pass this, to pass similar bills in their own state, pretty soon we would see people on the West Coast, people on, on the Gulf Coast, people in Texas, Nebraska, Montana, all over demanding that they that their state legislatures pass the same policy. Now back this last summer, I last summer I attended um, a rally outside of the state, outside of the governor's mansion and the state um, legislator, legislature. And I, the, the reason that why the cops didn't arrest us is because they knew it would, it would put a spotlight on us. It would, it would help our cause more than it would hurt it. So we, right. we didn't see, we didn't see any arrests at those protests, That's even though, well. Well, especially on you because you're actually running for a seat. Yeah. So yeah, that would exactly. so, so that would have given you positive uh, coverage, not negative. Yeah, getting arrested actually gives you a good rep nowadays. Who who would have uh, thunk it? <laughs> well, it depends on what you're being arrested for. Uh, but yeah, uh, see, so you also you're you're for uh, universal housing. Uh, right. uh, is there a possibility that uh, all the idle houses and apartment complexes and anything that's residential can be purchased at a state level, but left to the community to decide uh, how the money is how, how the money is allocated from the rents? Oh, absolutely. I mean, like for example, in England, the the way that property values work, or the way that um, property ownership works is that if you own a property and um, it's foreclosed on, meaning that the bank owns it, and that property sits in foreclosure for a certain period of time, it then becomes um, state-owned property. And then once the state owns it, they use resources in order to bring it up to code, make sure that it's livable, make sure that it's um, that you know, a person or, or a family is able to live there. And then they rent it out at a much lower rate, which keeps the neighborhood from being gentrified. And it keeps people off the streets. Now they still have homeless people in the UK. So my, what I would love to see is a situation where like in the city of Buffalo, for example, there are you can drive down um, Bailey, or Ch you can drive down Bailey or Clinton Avenue in in um, on the west side of Buffalo, and you can see um, either on the west side or the east side. You know, take your pick. You can see um, boarded up houses. You know that that are surrounded by these up and coming neighborhoods that you know have been built by rich people, and uh, it's like what a waste of resources. You know, we, we have all of these boarded up houses just in the city of Buffalo alone to guarantee housing to every single man, woman, and child 
in the city. And the fact that we are not using um, our vast amount of resources in the state to spend a tiny fraction of it in order to bring these buildings up to code, because a lot of these abandoned houses have wiring that is that has been chewed to hell by rats and mice. They have pipes missing because a lot of people will go into these old abandoned houses and rip out the copper plumbing because copper is really expensive and they can get money for it. And um, if we just used a tiny fraction of the resources we have currently, we could replace the wiring, replace the plumbing, bring the entire house up to code, and we could have, you know, we wouldn't have a homeless issue in the city of Buffalo if we did that. We, we would not see people struggling to survive or being kicked out of their houses because even, even in the UK, it's still not, it's illegal to a certain degree for you to kick somebody out of their house if they have no safe place to go. You know, they can apply for, um, you know, they, they can apply for um, government run housing just like they can here in the United States, but it's still not illegal for you to, for a person to make another person homeless, for them to leave them without shelter. And especially with COVID still, it's COVID still rising. Even though we have vaccines rolling out and millions of people that have been vaccinated, it's still an issue. People are still catching it. And the fact that we don't have a system in place for them to shelter in place is unconscionable. So what we need to do in order to prevent people from getting kicked out of their houses and being left homeless is we need to establish a law that says if you want to evict somebody, then you need to contact the state at the state first so that we can transfer them to state-run housing so in order to ensure that they do not go without um, in order to ensure that they do not go without shelter. If you don't want somebody living on your property, that's fine. But you cannot just kick them out and leave them with no safe place to go. So if you want to evict somebody, you better get on the horn and contact the, st and contact, um, the state so that they can be set up in state-run homes. And the fact that we don't have a system like this that would save us tens of thousands of dollars per person it, it's it it, it, might, it bends the mind, you know. It really does because every time you see a homeless person out on the street, they come with a price tag of about eighty thousand dollars. That's how much it costs for a person to go without a home because they need things like because it it costs us money in healthcare. It costs us money in food and in you know, because they still need to eat, they still need resources in order to survive. But um, if we gave them a home to live in, it would diminish the cost, the cost that it would, the amount that it would cost us in order to house somebody is significantly less than what it costs for them to just lose their house and, and their home and be out with no place to go. Uh, uh, sounds like a good plan that, that you have as far as that part goes. Uh, you're also in the universal basic income. Is that the same as what uh, Andrew Yang was uh, was uh, referring to or a different person? I know there's like at least five different types of universal uh, basic income. Well, in, in the state of Baltimore, they actually had a program last year. Where was it this year? I think they passed it last year. And they were able to give the residents in this one city um, $500 every single month to use for whatever they wanted to. They would just give it to everybody who lived in the city. You know, it, all you had to do in order to apply was prove your residency via a, um, a utility bill in your ID or, um, or a piece of mail saying that, hey, yeah, I, I pay bills here, I live here. So yeah, I, I, I want that money. And they found that people were actually able to go to work for the first time in years because they were able to afford things like gas. They were able to afford things like a bus card and childcare. They were able to afford things like a, a, a you know um, a uniform that you know or some 
some other form of professional attire that you need in order to go and work in a specific place. So they, um, they were able to get more people back to work and contribute more towards the local, um, the local economy than they otherwise would have by just staying at home and not working. Mm. And, um, you know, that's, that, that seems like a really great idea. And I would absolutely love to see something like that. But the truth is that if we pass a universal basic income at the federal level, because the Senate and really all of Congress has the power of the purse, we could afford to give every single man, woman, and child in the country $2,500 to $3,000 a month and you know, pay for and give each child um, $1,000 a month. We, we, we could afford to do that and it would lift millions of people, including children, out of poverty. It would enable people to get out of dangerous situations, like if they are living in a house where domestic violence is an issue, it would allow them to live on their own and get out of that dangerous situation without having to rely on a job in order to do so. It would allow people to um, just do all kinds of things that would benefit not just the economy, but their own personal um, what's the word I'm looking for, their own personal autonomy in the world. Like they could, they wouldn't be reliant on any one person in order to live a life that's, that is filled with dignity and safety and security. They would be, they would just be able to do it all by themselves and, you know, possibly even start their own business. They would, they would be able to contribute so much more and that's the thing that bothers me is when people talk about universal income, especially on the news, you see them talking about it as a cost. And it's not. It's an investment. If you give, like in New York State, for example, a form of universal income that we have is in the form of food stamps. And for every single, do for every single dollar that we spend giving people um, access to food, we see an increase in the economy by, by an additional 70 cents. So for every dollar we spend giving somebody SNAP benefits or, or food benefits, we see a 70% return on that investment. And that's what drives me crazy because we are constantly talking about investing in human welfare as though it's a handout, as though it's a cost to us, something that we should we can give if we want to but we're not obliged to because it's just too expensive it's too expensive not to provide this service to people and it should be it's it, it, all of these things should have happened decades ago we've had we've had um social security and snap benefits and medicare and medicaid ever since lyndon b johnson was in office and the fact that we haven't expanded it to cover every single person in the country is disgusting, especially when you consider the fact that we have groceries and convenience stores that are throwing out unexpired food in order to make room for more product as the shipments come in. There are people, there are stores that, and I, I, I've seen it happen because I've spent a great deal of time working as a cashier in, in retail stores and in grocery stores and in convenience stores. I've spent some time in, in that industry and I have seen them take food that is not, I have seen them take food that is not expired and throw it away to make room for fresher product that just came in off of the truck. And it should be illegal for them to throw out food, especially when we have millions of children who are currently food insecure. It's, it's some, stuff like that should not be happening. It's, it, it's, it's, it's criminal that it does. All right. And that, and that actually the main reason why big, big stores do that is so they can write out what, what they had to throw out in order to bring in new, new food. And it's, it cost, I think it costs more uh, to a certain degree uh, to give it to food banks, I think. Uh, that, that's the main reason why I think that some big stores don't uh, uh, give food to local food banks. But I don't know yeah. about that. I don't know if that's the case, but that's my that's my thought on it. But uh, and what people need to know or need, need to learn is uh, the only expenditure that is costly are the uh, are the 
the tax incentives that big corporations get because those are those are quite literally counted as uh, government expenditures because it's that's a uh, policy choice. Yes. That's a one hundred percent a policy choice. We could end food scarcity in this country. We could end homelessness in this country. We could make sure that the newborn and maternal death rate decreases instead of increases. And we are not doing it because we have people who are making money off of the desperation and death and destruction of our communities and the people who live in them. Right. Uh, you also wanted to do reparations for descendants of slaves and indigenous peoples. Uh, Absolutely. And, and what regard are you referring to that? Well, reparations are what are the costs that we pay to people that we have hurt immorally. So it's, you know, it, when colonialism started back in the 17th century in this country, so many horrific things began to happen as a result of that. You know, people who lived here and had thriving societies before we ever even set foot on this land, they, they, they were living lives that were full of dignity and, and safety and security. They, they, they were, they had their own, they had their own autonomy. And when we, when, when people came, emigrated from Europe to, to the Americas, they brought a sense of entitlement with them. They thought that because they, their beliefs, they, they thought their belief system was better than the native's belief system. They thought that because they had white skin and they had dark skin, that that made them better than everybody else that lived here. And th when you have a sense of self-entitlement like that, you can do horrific things to people. You can kidnap their children. You can slaughter whole families, whole villages. You can send children away to, um, to colonial institutions where they were taught that their religion was wrong and they needed to conform and accept their religion as fact because they, in their minds, they were saving their souls, which was not true. There was nothing wrong with the religion that they were using that it was that they that they subscribed to their entire life. There was nothing wrong with it, but they were being taught that it was. And if they refused to believe so, they were they were beaten, they were tortured, they were killed. So many children have been lost because of in the name of in the name of colonialism. Then. That, that should have, that they should have been able to live their lives as children. And they were punished for using any language that wasn't English. You know, they, they, you know how many hundreds of languages existed in the United States before the English, before English speaking people came over? It, it, it was, the, the, the amount of diversity that existed in this country was amazing. And that was all destroyed. And the yes. monstrous things that, well, the monstrous things that we have done to these people, the least that we can do is pay them, is pay them reparations and, and make up for all of the horrific things that we have done and continue to do to them. Yeah. So, the, so, so, so that means like paying back, like, that's, a certain amount of a certain amount to, for for uh, for slavery and maybe possibly to bring back land. I think that Biden did that a few months ago. He gave back the, at least some some parcel parcel of land. Uh, you're also for uh, for increasing the, the federal minimum wage uh, to what? Uh, uh, twenty five dollars an hour. Okay, twenty five dollars an hour. Okay. Uh, now, does that include inflation or not include inflation, or just a? Uh, well, it would include if we pass um, the twenty-five dollar an hour minimum wage at the federal level. It would, um, it would, it would, it would include a cost of living increase every single year, because even when we 
established a minimum wage in um, the early 1900s in this country, productivity increased every single year that the cost of living did, meaning that people were able to do more with the resources that they had in their workspace as long as they continued to live a life that, um, that was full of dignity and safety and, and financial security. Now, the, now, even though the minimum wage has not increased since 2000, no, oh, I forget what year it was that the minimum wage increased at the federal level, but uh, it's it was been like a while. 86. 86, yeah, that's right. And I forgot, it, in, in New York, it, it increased in 2009. Anyways, um, at the federal level, it was 1986. And we, even though productivity has increased since then, we, we still haven't seen an increase in the minimum wage since. And if we, and the fact that the cost of living continues to rise only increases the chances that people are not going to be able to make it to work if they don't have financial security. You know, they, one of the flaws of capitalism is that it incentivizes um, a person, it incentivizes the profit margin above everything else. And if we don't want, if we want to see productivity increase in this country, then we absolutely um, need a federal minimum wage increase because you can't expect people, and I think this is part of the reason why so many people haven't returned to work yet, even though there's lots of companies out there who are hiring. Part of the reason they haven't returned to work is because they really don't see the point. You know, they, they can't afford gas, which keeps going up in price. They can't afford rent, and you can't uh, get a job unless you have an address to put down on the job application. That's something everybody forgets, but you, you need a, a place to, to live if you want a job. And if we want people to get back to work, we need a universal basic income and reparations immediately, but we also need a federal, um, a federal minimum wage increase. Because right now, um, there's there's only, there, there's no state where a person can live on the federal minimum wage and afford rent on a one bedroom, one bathroom apartment. You know, the only place where, and I, I could be wrong at this point because the cost of living has gone up since the study was done, but the only place, um, according to an article that I read back in 2010, where you, a $15 minimum wage was, was enough to afford rent on an apartment like that was in Arkansas. Literally nowhere else could you live and afford rent while, while making $15 an hour. It was just impossible. So what we need to do is, especially here in New York State, um, this study cited that in order to afford rent, you needed to make $38 an hour. It's probably more than that now. And in order to pay rent in the state of New York, we need a federal minimum wage increase of at least $25 an hour. In, in New York state, it should be closer to 40. But, you know, because people, because some of, the, of these job creators um, incentivize their own profit margin ahead of everything else, they don't want to pay that much for, for their workforce, so they don't. And because there's no federal guarantee to a $25 minimum wage, they have no incentive to provide one. Well, I mean, do you think we could do this through your other policy, which is policy of worker uh, union rights and expanding co-ops? Do you think that, that would uh, be an add-on to the more of the uh, support behind it? Absolutely. I mean, it's one thing to pass a $25 an hour minimum wage, but unless you have a, um, a policy that also um, increases that, that rate of pay for, and keeps it up with the cost of living, it doesn't really mean much. And if we have um, worker co-ops in our, 
in our country like they do in Spain. They have the Mondragon Corporation, which is, it, it's, it's a collaborative of the largest um, worker co-ops in the entire country. And they have, oh, um, I want to say like over a hundred different companies that are registered with Mondragon. And in order to be registered with them, you need to have employee ownership over the company, meaning that you don't have a board of directors, you don't have CEOs, you don't, you don't have a profit margin or um, a ratio of CEO to worker pay that is 300 times higher than what the workers make. You know, uh, it, and, 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 and to that, uh, you would, that would go, because the CEOs wouldn't, wouldn't exist, that would also help with campaign finance reform, right? Because the, uh, because the, the uh, unions could then go directly to, you know, campaign for actual uh, campaign, campaign reform. And how would that work as far as that part goes? Well, a worker co-op is different than a union. A union is something that exists in a privately owned business where you have a board of directors, CEOs, who maintain the business and control its finances. A worker co-op doesn't have any of that. A worker co-op is a company that has ownership, but the employees that work, but only by the employees that work there. Like and say, that, and, and that will lead that will lead into campaign uh, reform uh, because due to the uh, an existence of, uh, of, uh, of unions, uh, who then uh, the union leaders who get involved in politics and and help with the the lack of campaign reform uh, with the co-ops that could have had, that could have give you, give them a better understanding of how to uh, initiate uh, negotiations with politicians and other things without actually having to pay them, put money in their pockets. Yeah, because when you have worker-run co-ops, you don't have people who are concerned with the profit margin. They are to a certain degree, but they're more worried about their productivity. And productivity only really increases substantially when you have workers that have an invested amount of pride in what they do and ownership in what they do. So if you have a company that manufactures, I don't know, like t-shirts and scrubs and, um, and other forms of clothing that people use when they go to work and it's owned by the employees, then they have an incentive to um, be more productive because the more items they can ship out to the people who need them and buy them, then the more they, then more then the more they can take home at the end of the week or at the beginning of the month whenever they get paid. So if we have a situation where worker co-ops are the norm instead of unions, then we. I, I would argue that it's better be simply because you won't see and you won't ever see a situation arise where there's um, where people compromise safety and pay and working conditions ahead of um, ahead of the employees because the employees own it. The, the employees don't want to work in a, in don't want to work in an environment that's unsafe, that is substandard, that is, you know, that doesn't pay them enough. So why would they? Right. Well, we're running out of time, but um, let's kind of go over your uh, your policies. And first of all, uh, for, if you want to like, uh, help you out as far as donations or whatever, they go to congresskate.com. Uh, let's see. One of the, the, the first things we talked about was the Renew Deal. Uh, she's for uh, uh, Venture for All, for universal housing, for universal basic income, um, for, rep for reparations, and for descendants of slaves and indigenous people, increasing federal, uh, increasing federal minimum wage to 25 bucks now, you said. Uh, campaign finance reform, uh, she wants to turn the companies uh, over from CEOs to the workers. Uh, she wants uh, to uh, uh, enhance uh, mental health advocacy for children. She wants to also do something for adults. Uh, she wants uh, immigration rights and ending ICE. She also wants gun reform. Uh, she wants to uh, uh, highlight 
the uh, and give rights more rights for rights and uh, civil liberties of uh, the LGBTQIA plus. Uh, and also, she wants to uh, end foreign wars, uh, which for college, which, which all these are great policies to, to go for. And uh, I hope you do win, so because this country does need policies like those implemented. Uh, also, fully fund the primary K K through 12 and universal preschools, ending the drug war, uh, criminal justice reform, uh, and the backlog of rape kits, uh, reproductive rights free child care and paid family leave, uh, ending food waste and protecting the press and First Amendment. So all that and more uh, if she's able to get in office. So uh, I'd like to thank you for being on today. Uh, maybe we could do a little more in depth next time, but unfortunately the time's kind of running out today. So uh, That's okay. <laughs> and we, we had to cover a lot. I know I have a lot of policies on my website, but if you ever want to have me on for an interview and talk more in depth about one specific or two specific policies, that's that's totally fine with me. Okay, well, it sounds great. And we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about that uh, on Twitter. But thanks for being here, and uh, I, I wish you the best of luck as far as I campaign and otherwise. Thank you so much. Have a good day.